Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to our channel. Thanks for logging on. Today we have a match that's a bit of a rematch, as I've previously pit the Grand Seiko Snowflake against Rolex hardware. In take one, it was the Air King. Today, we have more of a technical and aesthetic equivalent to put up a better fight to the Grand Seiko's might. So let's start. Rolex Datejust 41 versus Grand Seiko Snowflake begins now. Since you've seen the Grand Seiko previously, let's start with the Rolex. It's a timepiece that I can wear easily, despite the fact that it is a 41mm watch. The Datejust 41 that launched at Basel World 2016 was a bit of an aesthetic and ergonomic refinement of the previous 41mm Datejust 2, a watch that ran from 2009 to 2015. And you can see on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, the Rolex is comfortable and it fits well. It's a true 47.5mm lug to lug because the Super Jubilee bracelet and links don't protrude beyond the end of the case. The timepiece is slim at 11.7mm thick. We already know that it's a 41mm watch. The timepiece, however, equipped with a Jubilee bracelet, originally born with the Datejust model in 1945. It was the 40th anniversary of Rolex, and thus the Jubilee. We actually lost the Jubilee option during the Datejust 2 era, as only the three-link Oyster was available. Well, the Jubilee is back as the Super Jubilee with all solid links. It's a comfortable and, one might even say, unexpectedly sporting proposition, as the Jubilee with all solid center links feels more solid on the wrist. Previously, the Jubilee was a bit delicate. Supple, yes, but delicate. Here, with all solid links, you feel like you could wear this watch anywhere you would wear the Oyster. Polished outer faces, you can see differential finish, differential size, differential alignment to animate this short link bracelet that is wonderfully silken on the skin. You can see that the ventilation is even better than on the Oyster. A lift lock clasp, a high grade piece, as you can see, featuring a raised rather than embossed or stamped down Rolex crown. You can always tell the Indented Rolex crown is a hallmark of the entry-level models. Not the case here. Fully finished clasp internally with a beak and hook system. It's a lift lock. You can't just pull it open. You need to unlock it. Quite secure. Internally, there is a easy link system that gives you five millimeters of tool-free adjustment in or out. You can see removable links are fixed by screws, and there's a final degree of adjustment built into the interior of the clasp. You can see these different anchoring points inside. So if you use your strap tool, you can actually change the root of the bracelet inside the clasp for sizing. So three different ways to size the watch on your wrist. Jumping back to the case, you can see the integration of the end links with the case is immaculate and seamless. And for once, I don't have to slate Rolex for its slab-sided lack of grace. This is not the super case. This is no GMT or Submariner. It has the fluid lithe form, almost like a flame surfaced effect that does wonderful things, bending the light and enchanting the mind. This is a wonderfully elegant traditional Rolex case profile shared with the other Datejust models and the likes of the Daytona. You can see it's handsomely tapered and wonderfully compound in its curvature. The bezel is a strong stylistic component, and as this is the 126300, it features a full steel bezel that is broad and angular, giving way to a dial of chalk white composition. Important to note here, there are several different case, bracelet, and dial options, but among the two watches in our test, only the Datejust 41 features the option of a loomed dial. The loomed indices, the hands, and the five-point Rolex coronet, all in white gold to avoid tarnish over time. Contrast is excellent. The use of a monotone white disc for the date means that it almost disappears against the matte white base of the dial. And unlike the smaller Rolex watches or smaller Datejusts, the Cyclops eye doesn't appear to monopolize the dial of the 41 millimeter Datejust 41, which, and I've measured, features the same dial span and crystal span of the original Datejust 2, so this has not been compressed it still wears its Cyclops eye well proportionally, and functionally, it absolutely delivers the goods. It is easy to see that date. Inside, Oyster Case, Twin Lock Crown, 100 meters water resistant, Rolex manufacturer caliber 3235, automatic winding, 70 hour power reserve, Rolex's unique Liga etched Kroner G style escapement, stop seconds, as well as a quick set date, full balance bridge, and a free sprung index for shock resistance, overcoil hairspring to help it beat concentrically in every position, and earn both a COSC chronometer certification and Rolex's self described superlative chronometer, a factory attestation that the watch will run plus two minus two per day or better. Finally, parachrome blue alloy for that hairspring to help resist magnetism. Jumping over to Grand Seiko. 
The Grand Seiko is a remarkably handsome piece, and though 41 millimeters in diameter, its composition from what Grand Seiko calls high-intensity titanium, and I call grade 5 titanium, means it wears like a 36 or a 35 millimeter watch. It is almost unnervingly light. 42, or 41 millimeters in diameter is 12.8 thick, so it is over a millimeter thicker than the Grand Seiko. Lug to lug, it's a bigger watch as well, 48.7, and if you include the solid end links, it's a beefy 52 across the wrist. So if size is a constraint, not mass, but size, you might want to go with the Rolex. This is a full-figured watch. That said, this watch also features strap tool apertures in the lugs, so it does invite swapping to straps, and it would look natural, as the integration of end link to watch isn't quite as seamless as on the Rolex. Ironically, the bracelet here is reminiscent of nothing so much as Rolex's three-link oyster bracelet, but it is beautifully detailed. Titanium like the watch itself, staggered link size, alignment, and finish. My favorite detail is the hairline bevel that separates the hoods of these links from their flanks, and you can see that's beautifully extended down from the lugs. Now the bracelet does cut costs a bit with pin sleeves for removable links, and that makes sizing difficult because you'll need a punch and a block, and it's just not a user-friendly system, nor is there any kind of adjustment built into the clasp, but you can see it as a hand some piece nicely finished with raised and relieved Grand Seiko on a satin base, twin trigger release so it is quite secure when closed. The case flank has it all over the Rolex. This is where the Grand Seiko begins to make its advantages felt. The case band is black polished, optically smooth and mirrored. This is the famed tin plate manually applied Zeratsu finish for which Grand Seiko cases are known, and this watch gives you a lot of it. This is a true hand finished product, whereas the Rolex is more of an industrial good, and this is a decision point for those who might go Grand Seiko. Also note the contrast between the sheer sides, the bevels, and the satin tops. It's not just a hand finished case, it's a more interesting and distinctive case shape. You will note that the integration of bezel is perhaps a little bit more fluid here, as the bezel itself is pared down compared to what you see on the Rolex. The dial is a standout. Grand Seiko, not collectors, but Grand Seiko itself, its watchmakers and designers, nicknaming this watch the snowflake, as the rusticated imagery of the dial is designed to evoke the blown drifts of, of snow that you will see outside of Grand Seiko and Seiko Epson's northern Japan watchmaking workshops. The furniture on the dial, as well as the hands, are extraordinary. Though not loomed, you won't miss it, as everything that is metal is polished and faceted. The hands at center are black polished and faceted with a knife-like edge, and the same can be said of each of the indices. The dial furniture here is one of the highlights of the watch, and yes, you do get a power reserve indicator to trace the autonomy remaining of your watch. You can also see the spring drive system driving the hand seamlessly along the dial, absolutely smooth, and it's not just visually distinctive, it is technically adept, as it endows the watch with precision of plus or minus 15 seconds per month. Remember, Rolex will only swear to plus or minus two seconds per day. Day. On the case back, you can see caliber 9R65, automatic winding, 70 hour power reserve, stop seconds, quick set date, and yes, spring drive. There is no motor here, there are no batteries, there are no capacitors. All of the energy and the motion metered out by a mechanical drivetrain and a traditional mainspring, but this unidirectional governing wheel activates a quartz oscillator, creating an induced current and, in conjunction with back EMF forces, speeding up or slowing down the motion of the train to the hands, depending on whether the quartz oscillator detects it's moving too slowly or too quickly, and thus it achieves that extraordinary accuracy. Work on this project started in 1977. Automatic spring drive wasn't ready until 2005, and that's with Seiko Epson's resources dedicated. This is a modern marvel. So let's talk about the advantages of these watches, and I'm going to quickly transition back to the Rolex, because again, the Rolex is the unfamiliar of the two. We've seen the Grand Seiko before. Now, this is a timepiece that, hands down, offers you nighttime legibility. The option to get the same watch with a loomed or non-loomed dial gives you flexibility and usability. Loom is a huge advantage if this is going to be your only watch or your main watch. Unrivaled history. I mentioned earlier that this was the Jubilee model, the Datejust, launched in 1945 with the Jubilee bracelet. And since then, its catalog of owners has been a who's who of history, from Winston Churchill to Dwight Eisenhower and everyone since then 
who has mattered, celebrities, politicians, the famous and the infamous, they've all worn datejusts. Also important, uh, this is a watch that offers you flexibility to customize just a bit. Different bracelets, you can get the Oyster or the Jubilee, different metals, different bezels, different dials. You can mix and match and get the same fundamental strengths that you see in this model. Also, five-year warranty versus a three-year warranty with the Grand Seiko. Objectively, huge advantage. I'll also mention that the Rolex is better for a smaller wrist and it's also better for a tighter cuff. As you can see, the difference in thickness is dramatic. The Rolex, moreover, features a bracelet and clasp of higher quality. Individual removable links sized by screws, not pin sleeves. A clasp that features multiple sizing adaptations, the individual stations, as well as the easy link system. More money was spent here, and it shows. It also feels more solid on the wrist, redoubtable and robust. You don't feel the need for the sporting oyster bracelet to have confidence in your timepiece. I'll also mention that this watch has Rolex cachet. I don't buy a watch on that basis, but these are luxury goods, and no name transcends the watch industry itself quite like Rolex. And for a lot of folks, that is going to be a consideration, especially if giving the watch as a gift. Everyone knows and loves Rolex, who who knows and loves luxury watches. And if they don't love Rolex, they respect Rolex. This is much less of an idiosyncratic and particular gift to give. If you've got to give a watch that's the right choice, this is the right choice. Moreover, a cleaner dial. The Cyclops eye here is not an encumbrance, not with a white dial and a white date disc, and not with the proportions of the Cyclops in relation to the size of the 41 millimeter watch. Uh, the Grand Seiko, a little bit more idiosyncratic. That power reserve cutout in the dial is going to be polarizing. Also important, a mechanical heartbeat. Just like the Rolex cachet, this is a subjective factor that's not universal. But if you believe a luxury watch should have a mechanical movement and the sound, the heartbeat, and the cadence to match, this is the one you want. Also, in terms of resale value or as a store of value, this is going to be your champion. As the Grand Seiko sells for $5,800 new, pre-owned for about five to five and a half thousand, whereas this watch right here sells for $7,450. And yes, the Jubilee does cost $100 more than the Oyster. So this this sells for $7,450, but it resells for about $7,500 to $8,000, so advantage Rolex in that respect. This is a no wrong answer answer to what should my only watch or my one watch be. The Grand Seiko, however, has character. The case, the finish, the shape, the spring drive movement, the dial, everything about this watch is distinctive and unique. It doesn't remind you of anything else. The Rolex reminds you of every other Rolex and every watch that copies Rolex, which is a hell of a lot of timepieces. I have yet to see a fake or knockoff snowflake. Also important, this is a hand-finished case beautifully executed, the Rolex Anodyne by comparison. And that's before we even get to the dial, which is itself finished to a degree that the Rolex cannot counter. The Rolex is handsome. The Grand Seiko, from the hands at center to the dial base to the furniture around the indices, all of that exceptional. It stands apart from the mostly machine-made Rolex watch. Even when the Rolex is handmade, and I have it on good account, dial features are hand-placed, the Grand Seiko still looks more handcrafted, and in the best possible sense of that term. I'll also mention that this watch is light and hypoallergenic. If you value those two qualities, this watch has it in spades. The Rolex, not so much with its high nickel 904L steel. The timepiece also features exclusive tech and the ability to see it. Do you want a display case back? The Rolex may have a mechanical heartbeat, but it does not let you see the watchmaker assembled movement. The Grand Seiko does, and it has a unique spring drive quartz mechanical hybrid, a technology exclusive to Seiko and Grand Seiko that you will not get in any other watch or any other watch family. Piaget tried and gave up. This is a Seiko monopoly in the modern era. I'll also mention that the timepiece features an extra complication. If you want a light duty complication, adding a power reserve might be the way to start your collection of complications. I'll also mention that there's a better balance of bezel to dial here. Look at the width of the bezel conical and polished, it's well balanced in relation to the size of the lugs and the size of the case. The Rolex, without its traditional fluted precious metal bezel, looks a little bit brutal and even a little bit crude. That is not a handsome proportion. That's a bit heavy-handed, and Grand Seiko stylists simply do better. I'll also mention the combination of the complex case and the three-link bracelet design means this is just a little bit sportier. Both watches have most of the same technical capabilities, down to power reserve and water resistance, but this is going to be the one that you pick if you want a more sporty physical appearance. I will have to knock Grand Seiko on one count. Three-year warranty, 
five-year warranty. Rolex is setting the pace. Grand Seiko needs to respond. That said, I tend to buy watches and expect good service. And from Grand Seiko, I have no reason by experience or reputation to expect anything less than the same reliability you would get in the Rolex. This watch has charm. It has technology. It has brand character. It's unique. It's objectively less common than any modern Rolex watch. Heck, it's less common than any Grand Seiko watch. This timepiece might be the only one you ever see if you own it, and it has plenty of virtues to make the relationship a long-term and pleasurable one. This would be my choice. You guys let me know in the comments below which of these two you would choose, and feel free to customize the Rolex Datejust and tell me what configuration you'd pick if this is your choice. Thanks so much. Grand Seiko is the last man standing. Now winner of two matchups against Rolex.